Have you ever had something that just seems so far beyond your grasp that you never even dared to dream it? One of those things that you just labeled as impossible? Well, for me, this is it. This is Antarctica. And it is the, the coldest, the windiest, and the driest continent on the planet. Oops. And yet, it is also this, this fragile place of indescribable beauty. And it's a place that I never imagined that I would get to. And I certainly never imagined that I would go there with 75 other women on the Homeward Bound Women in Science Leadership Expedition last December. And when I look at this photo, I still remember that feeling of utter astonishment and, and excitement. It was a real pinch me moment for me because this isn't something that I, I ever expected to do. And if you'd known me as a little girl, you wouldn't have expected me to do that either. And the reason is, is because when I was a little kid, I was an exceptional underachiever especially when it came to school. I worked really hard, but I really struggled with school and also suffered from this massive lack of self-confidence. And so I think it's, it's fair to say I was one of those kids who just hated school. And really, the only thing that got me through it were recess, gym class, and great friends. <laughs> so this photo of me, that look on, on my face, don't let it fool you because it's not a look of happiness because I'd brought home this wonderful school book as homework. Not at all. It was actually a look of self-satisfaction, because I'd just broken a deal with my mom. We'd agreed that if I read that entire school book from cover to cover in one night, she'd give me a chocolate bar. I know, isn't that awful, like bribing your kid to do homework, you know, using chocolate? But these were desperate times, and frankly, I was also, you know, it was the early 1970s, and I was part of the Kool-Aid generation, so, you know, the whole idea of bartering books and chocolate bars, I mean, nobody back then would blink an eye about it, right? I mean, this wasn't sort of a typical thing in our household, but it was a move of utter desperation by my mom who just needed to get me to practice my reading. Because reading didn't come easily to me. And in fact, learning in the classroom did not come easily. It was a real challenge. And I remember, you know, many Sunday nights where I'd cry myself to sleep at night because I, I had to go to school on Monday morning. And, you know, I know you're probably thinking, well, childhood drama, dramas, right? I mean, was it really that bad? And the answer is yes, it really was that bad for me. Imagine that you're eight years old and you're at school and you're sitting in class while the, while the teacher is going over the answers to the math problems that you've been working on. And she's asking students to share their answers. And you're sitting there thinking, oh God, is she going to call on me? And you're just sitting there and your palms are sweating and your heart's pounding. And you just have this real sense of dread because you just know that this teacher is going to call on you. And the problem is, is that you know that all of your answers are wrong. And you would give anything for the teacher and all the kids in that class not to know that. And so you sit there kind of staring down at your desk, not looking at the teacher, just staring at your desk for what feels like an eternity, just waiting to see if the teacher's going to call on you. So finally, the lesson is over. And you're thinking, oh my god, she didn't call on me. I just dodged a bullet. But then the next day at school, you have that same sense of, of fear and dread, because this time, the teacher is asking students to read out loud. And you would give anything, and I mean anything, including that really hard one chocolate bar, not to have to stumble across the words on that page and read to the entire class. It was just something that I had a real sense of shame about, because if all the other kids could do it, why couldn't I? I mean, have you ever had that, that feeling, that sense of shame, where there was something that you feel like you should be able to do it, but you can't, and you desperately don't want the people around you to find out? Well, that's what school was like for me in the 1970s. And this was back in the days when they didn't really diagnose learning disabilities. What they did was they put you into remedial classes for extra work, which basically meant that they just piled more of the same work on top of you in the hopes that, well, maybe she'll get it. But didn't Einstein say that the definition of insanity was doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result? Well, this is what remedial classes were like for me. It was, it was just more frustration about learning, but it was also a daily reminder of my inability to achieve. And it just made me feel really stupid. Now, I know I'm not the first kid to ever struggle with school. But for me, it was especially discouraging because the only thing I ever wanted in life was to be a biologist. I don't know why, but I absolutely love nature. 
And I remember when I was two years old, I started collecting insects in our backyard here in Ottawa. And uh, it's funny because I think my parents thought this was just a phase that I was going through. And, you know, I have to say 50 years later, I'm still collecting insects in my backyard. So I think it's, you know, we're past the point of this is just a phase. But more than anything, I wanted to be a biologist. But how do you do that? How do you go to university to become a biologist when you're struggling so badly in school at such a young age? I mean, for me, the, the dream just wasn't going to happen. But then something changed for me when I hit grade five. I had this wonderful teacher at Arch Street Public School here in Ottawa. His name was Mr. Salter. And he was a science nut. He just loved science, especially biology. And it was so cool. He actually built a beehive in our classroom. It was really amazing because it was a wooden frame and it had uh, a honeycomb that was sandwiched between two panes of glass. And there was a little pipe that was connected to the outside so the bees could come and go. And I was mesmerized by that thing. I would, I would sit and stare at it and watch the bees come in and do their little waggle dance. And I just thought this teacher was so cool because we had bees in the classroom. Wow. I realize now that, yes, he was an exceptional teacher, but it wasn't just about bees. It was because he was the first teacher who, who recognized that I was really struggling with school. And rather than just send me back to those remedial classes, he did something else. He linked my learning to something that I was passionate about. He linked my learning to my love of nature. And so by doing this, that shy little kid who just wanted to be a biologist so badly started to enjoy learning. For the first time, I started to enjoy learning in the classroom. And as that happened, my self-confidence increased. And as my self-confidence increased, my, uh, my ability to kind of slog through those tough learning challenges grew. And so over time, those feelings of fear and dread and, and anxiety about school began to fade. I mean, it's interesting because I actually sort of grew to, to love learning. And as that process happened, something else happened as well. It became gritty. I mean, I still struggled, but as my self-confidence grew, my, my kind of determination to kind of slog through those challenges and keep going until I finally got it, until I finally figured things out, it started to grow as well. And don't get me wrong, there were still tons of challenges and failures along the way, but something else happened. I became resilient. For some reason, I was no longer afraid of failure. It didn't bother me. And so the first, for the first time in my life, I started to actually step outside my, my comfort zone and do things that I normally would not have done, even though there was the risk that I could fail. And it's, it's interesting because I remember back to my grade 13 chemistry teacher who said to me, don't bother applying to university, you'll never make it, don't waste your time. And I didn't say a word to him, but in my own mind, all I could think of was, yeah, well, just watch me. And I'm happy to say that I ignored his advice and uh, I went on to graduate from Carleton University with an honors bachelor of science in biology. And then I went on to do masters and then a PhD. And so I went from that, from a person who just felt like they'd never accomplish anything in life to somebody who just refused to give up. And so that little kid who was just terrified to give an answer to a math problem in class went on to do things that she never imagined possible. I am so lucky because I actually achieved my dream of becoming a biologist. I was a, a university professor and a research scientist in a career that I just absolutely loved. I was also part of a team at University of Guelph who pioneered something called DNA barcoding. Um, it's now a global research initiative, and it's amazing because it's given us a tool now to inventory the diversity of life on Earth using short DNA sequences. And most recently, I created my own environmental um, education organization, which is focused on connecting people, especially young people, to nature. And this is the thing that gets me out of bed in the morning but it's also my way of paying it forward and I hope maybe inspiring just a few young people, much the way that Mr. Salter inspired me all those years ago. So what did I learn from my, my childhood journey? Well, I learned that not only is struggle good, I think it's necessary. I mean, it, it's hard. I mean, so often it's accompanied by failure and, and who likes to fail? You know, put up your hand if you love that feeling of falling flat on your face. 
Yeah, I don't see any hands going up. It's awful. It feels terrible and frankly can just suck. But I really think that failure is one of the ways that we develop those things that allow us to succeed in life. And I think from my own personal experiences, I believe that the recipe for success involves three important things. And when we combine those important things, it can actually allow ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Those three things are passion, grit, and resilience. To me, passion is the fuel that propels us forward and it motivates us to take chances because we want to accomplish something so badly, we're willing to risk failure to do it. Grit, grit is the thing that keeps us trying and it won't let us give up no matter what. But resilience is really important too because it's our ability to bounce back. It's our ability to recover from failure and to get back to being gritty again. Sir Edmund Hillary once said that um, you don't have to be a hero to accomplish great things. You can simply be an ordinary chap sufficiently motivated to reach challenging goals. And I really believe this. I think if you're passionate enough about something, you'll risk failure to do it. But I think there's another really important point to make here, and that's that it's not just the chaps, it's us girls too. We can accomplish great things. And I think we need to do a much, much better job of inspiring and encouraging and, and motivating young girls to dream big and to become extraordinary. I also worry, though, that I think society today has, has removed the opportunity for challenge and struggle in young people. I think when everybody's a winner, nobody fails, and everybody gets a medal just for participating, are we setting the bar too low? And are we removing the opportunity for kids to become gritty and resilient? I think so, and I worry that by doing this, we also remove the opportunity for kids to go from ordinary to extraordinary. This is one of the defining moments of my life. As a biologist who is so passionate about nature, to be sitting here on Deception Island in Antarctica, surrounded by 250,000 chinstrap penguins. I had my camera out and I'm, I'm photographing them on their nests, incubating eggs, and, and then this little fellow wandered up and we had a conversation. <laughs> this, I, I don't even have the words to tell you how I felt at this moment or what this experience meant to me. All I can say is that this is where passion, grit, and resilience got me. That same photo was actually featured in a blog post by a, a wonderful organization called One Million Women. And it was, a, it was an article about three of us from that Homeward Bound Women in Science Leadership Expedition. And it was about how each of us in our, in our own way was leading the fight to protect the environment. And I have to say that, you know, when I think back to those struggles, those childhood struggles and all the drama and, you know, all of those, those nights where I cried myself to sleep, I never thought that they would lead me to something like this. Before I leave you, I want to introduce you to Mr. Salter, my grade five teacher. <laughs> and I'm not sure where he is, but I am so happy over here, here he is, to say that he is here in the audience tonight. <laughs> it was fantastic. A couple of months ago, we met, and I had the opportunity to thank him in person for all he had done for me as the most amazing teacher back in 1975. I mean, I really think that teachers like him only come along once in a lifetime. And so I am phenomenally grateful because I never realized that the help that he would give me 42 years ago would impact my life in such a significant way. So thank you very, very much. And finally, to the folks out there who are struggling, I just have one message. And that is don't give up. Grow your grit. Grow your resilience and keep trying. Because I really and truly hope that you too will one day have the opportunity to look back on your life and see what you've accomplished and think, wow, who knew? Thank you very much.